the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History, we rely on a network of collaborations with people and institutions from around the world to explore major questions in human origins and societal change. These global partnerships span dozens of countries and allow us to combine cutting-edge field and laboratory analyses to formulate new ways of understanding the past. On this web series, we'll talk with our international partners to hear about their interest in archaeology, their research, and their vision for the sustainability of archaeological research in the future. This is ArcheoChats. Hi, welcome to ArcheoChats, conversations with our partners from around the globe. I'm Emma Feinstone. And I'm Robert Padalano. Today we are joined by Dr. Julio Mercator of the University of Calgary and my former PhD advisor. Julio is an associate professor in Calgary, and he's been there for, I think, 17 years now. I believe he started in 2003, and he is an affiliated researcher at the Max Planck. In 2016, he was awarded a Canadian Research Council funding grant for $2.4 million to do research in Tanzania at Old Pie Gorge. This project includes scholars from four different countries at 10 different organizations, uh, and I think more than 20 or 30 people now working on the project. Traditionally, he's been a Stone Age archaeologist, but also he reconstructs ancient environments using phytoliths and food life ways through starch analyses. He was an early pioneer in tropical forest archaeology in Central and West Africa, specifically in the Congo, and he was also an early pioneer in primate archaeology looking at chimpanzee stone tool accumulations in the Ivory Coast. And I think he can confirm this, but he's worked in, I don't know, maybe a dozen African countries from Cameroon to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Equatorial Guinea, Ivory Coast, Mozambique, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, and probably other countries I'm forgetting. He does, you can find him on Twitter at Olduvai Gorge SDS or at his project webpage at Olduvai Gorge SDS.com. Julio, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It really is a pleasure. I want to say... Uh, thanks very much to Emma and you for giving me the opportunity. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, so my first question is, what was your first introduction to Stone Age archaeology and how did your interest develop in your career? Well, I would say the, the overarching theme in my work has been tropical ecology and uh, culture across biomes. I mean, I, I, I like all tropical ecology. I remember looking into the Amazon or the Southeast Asian forest when I was in training as a grad, but my, my expertise and what is near and dear in my heart really is the African continent. I think my first intro to the topic of how humans build, uh, modify, cross, transform uh, ecological boundaries was when I, a, when I was a grad student and I was going to my PhD field site. We departed a Nairobi in a really, really tiny plane, one of those low altitude flights that you can see pretty much everything. And so we departed Nairobi and flew over the Maasai Mara and then Lake Victoria, which is pretty intimidating when you fly over it. And then we landed in Entebbe, you know, near Kampala. Then another flight onto the Western Rift, you know, Lake Albert, and of course into the Congo Basin. And when we flew over, I remember seeing so many boundaries and the boundaries were really like a, like a wall. You could, you could see that they were artificially maintained, fire, grazing, the, uh, whatever it is, arid on the one side, wet on the other, woodlands here, rainforest here. And then I thought, wow, it really must be fascinating being able to understand how these boundaries go back in time and uh, how they shaped human evolution. But I think that was really what struck me and stuck with me for my entire career. That's, that's yeah, that must have been some, something, right? Flying over, you know. Yeah, there was a beautiful, to beautiful trip. From lake environment to mountain to forest, <laughs> really seeing the, the yeah. entire transect across Central Africa there. Yes. Um, so I, I briefly mentioned the Stone Tools Diet and Sociality Project. I know we're sort of jumping ahead here about 20 years or so. 
Um, yeah. But seeing how it's Canada's leading uh, research project in Paleolithic archaeology or Estonia's archaeology, uh, maybe you just want to comment on the current work you're doing uh, at Olduvai Gorge. Well, with Olduvai, really in our field in archaeology, I, I don't think the place needs much introduction because it's one of the best studied uh, paleoanthropological. Uh, localities in the world that is where not long ago a uh, sort of a mini canyon developed by erosion and because it really dug through the terrain it exposed a bunch of old sediments not really old for the geologists but old enough for us in archaeology so going back two million years and I think all of us remember how the, uh, shocking and impressive going to Olduvai Gorge really is the first time and whether you're young or old doesn't really matter I don't think you can get cynical enough to not be impressed by the gorge and then you go there and you see more than a hundred meters of sediment accumulation with different beds and of course, who doesn't know bed one and bed two and so forth. And so there, what we do is we study the interface of a human ecology, which is to say how hominins, the environment, technology, and diet come together. And I think that for the archaeologists, the perfect substrate to do that really is lithics. If you know how to deal with them in non-traditional ways, e.g. by looking for food residues or environmental proxies, they, they can be made into a fascinating subject matter. And that's, that's how the project Stone Tools, Diet and Sociality came about. Well, Old Divai definitely is iconic. We actually had um, Shirshi Young on the show, she brought up Olduvai as when she was a kid, she dreamed of Olduvai and that's what sparked her research interests in early archaeology in China. So definitely has a huge impact on the field, just the site itself. Um, so my question is, how and why did you come to team up with the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Yina? Yeah, well, I don't know if you know this, I don't even know that Mike would want me to disclose this, but uh, Mike Petraglia and I actually met when I was a postdoc in Washington, D.C. So because the two of us were part of the Human Origins program uh, in the late 90s, that is how we actually met. And uh, there was a friendship there for years. When the Institute was created, there was also the link with Nikki, She's from the University of Calgary as well. Her first degree was from here. And um, also Nikki's interest in the Anthropocene, as you know, you guys are leading a global uh, project trying to investigate the markers that allow archaeologists to identify the Anthropocene. Well, I'm also a part of that project and I've been helping out with the phytoic analysis in terms of trying to pick up signals from the recent record that would say, well, there is a anthropogenic modification being substantial here. In addition to that partnership, we have one PhD student that we co-supervise with Mike, and that is Arturo. So that, that's a little bit the, the grand tour of how we work with the Max Planck. Yeah, great. Uh, perfect. I was actually just going to ask about the Anthropocene Global Markers Project, but you sort of just addressed it. Uh, yeah, this is a, a really big project spearheaded by another postdoc, Andrea P. Um, and people involved all over the world doing different, you know, scientific right. aspects, trying to answer questions uh, in terms of human impact on, on the globe, mm -hmm. really. So, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. We had already talked about Stone Tools Diet and Sociality. How has Max Planck created value or added additional value to that project? Uh, that didn't come about until the, the, the official collaboration. It, it really has been 
really fundamental because the global network that the Institute has is able to really distribute, share samples from all over the world to different experts. Uh, the same applies to the lithic analysis that Arturo is doing for his thesis, right? I mean, he really is bringing in the kind of expertise in new paradigms to analyze stone tools. And that is also happening or is materializing because of this shared platform that we have with the Max Planck. The best way to do it is by having triangle so that people from Germany can go to Tanzania, people from China can come over also to Olduvai, but then at the same time, the human mobility of the personnel allows you that we go to China and work with them. Also, it is an opportunity for our African colleagues to go to Germany for training, to come to Canada, to go to China. So I really think it's a, it's a wonderful, unique opportunity because it really allows people from all over the world to really to uh, operate as one. And frankly, these days, with the many changes happening in academia, maybe this is the way forward. I think you're absolutely right. And it's, um, it's interesting to hear you say that because these ideas are kind of why we came up with ArcheoChats as an idea in the first place. Just this global connection where research in China in Africa, in Europe, like it shouldn't just be isolated, it needs to be this sphere. Yeah. I want to emphasize that it is also by opening the doors mm -hmm. to our African colleagues, you know, yeah. our Chinese colleagues, not only to come to Germany or Canada, but also to go to Africa or for the African colleagues to go to China, let's say. Right. I think that is the true sign. I mean, I think that would be the indication that the discipline is really coming of age when it comes to functioning the way it should. Uh, one question that I have is really, and I always wonder this issue, this, uh, the answer to this myself is, what actually do you enjoy most about archaeology? What is, what is it that keeps you going? I, I love the field. I love the challenging logistics. But I also love creating a sense of community with the populations that I live with. So I would say that in the field, it is that combo of the beauty of Africa, the, uh, being an archaeologist, digging, logistics, and the people, really. That, that's, what, that's what makes me, that's what excites me. I know you've talked a lot about working in Africa for 25 years now and what you enjoy about it. You've worked in a whole variety of countries. Um, so what are some of the different challenges you've encountered? Um, what is really challenging? I would say that what was challenging to me 25 years ago and is challenging today and unfortunately not much has changed is that the, uh, we are the lucky ones, the ones with the money, the ones with the power to go wherever we want and do whatever we need or want to do for our careers. But it's really, really difficult to have our counterparts, colleagues in those countries, in those regions, to get to do what we do. When we do an expedition, I don't know, half or more of the people should be African the, uh, colleagues. And I don't mean to sign documents for us or get permits for us or take care of how do you buy a generator in an African market. I'm not talking about this. I would say that is the biggest challenge that comes to mind. And no matter how hard you try, for reasons that maybe we should not or cannot discuss here, uh, they don't change. I was just curious, I know your research group has begun using Old Pie Gorge with a P instead of a V on social media and in publications. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that change. I don't want to take all of the credit because this really was one of those things 
that evolve naturally in an organic way among the group, it was knowing that the place didn't get discovered by Western scientists like we learn in school. Because the place has always existed and there are traditional landowners who are the Maasai and like any other landowner you do have names for places meaning that frankly we didn't have to have Germans or British or Americans or Spaniards coming to this region to tell us that the actual name of the place is Olduvai with a V because the actual name that always existed was Olduvai with a P as in Paul because that is a reference to the plant that is growing all over the place and so is the gorge covered by that plant and frankly this should have happened a long time ago so that's why us as a group are making the effort but also and most importantly because the difference that that makes to our neighbors with whom we work and live on a daily basis is enormous you should see how the tone and the energy changes when they see that you are trying to learn local languages or that you actually give places traditional names, which is not even to say traditional, they, they simply are the names. Oldupai Gorge really is the name that that place always had, so it makes a difference to, to us. Yeah, uh, and it's simple, right? It doesn't take much to use a name that's always been used by people who live in the area. Take yeah. You're working in the western part of the gorge now at a site called Iwas Oldupai, on the way to Oldupai in the local Man uh, language. Um, but before that, it was just a way uh, geo Geo locality 63. Right. I mean, what does that mean to anybody, really? Yeah, it doesn't get any more invasive than that. Can you imagine a Maasai herder referring to a hill that you walked him up and down your entire life as geo locality 63? Really, if we think about it, it's pretty nonsensical. Yeah. So you've been pushing the boundaries in archaeological science with the Clean Lab and Mobile Field Unit. Um, how would you like Max Planck to be involved with future archaeometry projects? When it comes to archaeometry, this new archaeologist that is now working with the biologist, the geoscientist, the chemist, in, in crossing those boundaries, I think there is a lot to learn that is going to generate new ways of knowing what we cannot know now. And all of this came about because when I was trying to investigate food residue or ancient carbohydrates from stone tools, trying to learn a little more about hominin ecology and the origins of complex diets, combining carbohydrates and meat, I really run into a wall because the existing archaeological or archaeometric techniques that were being used couldn't really solve the questions I had. I think that when it comes to the archaeological analysis of ancient carbohydrates, so that we can infer whether hominins use them or not. I believe that traditional archaeological methods will not give you the answer. They can't. Going off of that, uh, I'm sure a lot of people will have a, a bunch of questions. Um, you had planned to do a workshop this year, sort of looking yes. at resident tracking and protocols and stuff. Obviously, it got postponed because of, of COVID-19. Uh, do you want to talk about the, the goals of the workshop and, and how you're going to address some of these issues? Yes, this was going to be a workshop a, that we are holding in Zanzibar, east of Dar es Salaam, in which our African colleagues, Europeans, Australians, Canadians, Americans were coming over, in which a third of the group is biologists, the other third really is 
geochemistry and, uh, and materials uh, science. And then the other third was residue analysis and useware analysis. We are doing this workshop because we believe that unless those groups of uh, scientists work together and understand what they are trying to do and do that functioning as one, we are going to continue running into those walls that don't let you uh, make progress. So it's time for an Archeo quiz question. All right, Emma, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, what do you and Julio have in common besides both being Stone Age archeologists? Uh, answer A, both at one point were professional athletes. Uh, B, you're both dog lovers and you basically like dogs more than people. C, you're <laughs> lovers of fine wine. And then D, you accidentally ran over a chicken in Mozambique. So I'm going to go with B, the dog lovers. You are correct. You are both big dog lovers, maybe two of the biggest dog lovers I've ever known. Um, and I don't know if you guys knew that you both were dog lovers, but that is something you have in common. All right. I think that just about does it for us. Well, that was great. Really, really fantastic. A very nice break from uh, the routines. And yeah, totally. Thank you very much.